We acknowledge that this event is taking place upon the traditional territories, the territories of the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations Confederacy, the Anishinaabe peoples of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations, and before them, the Chinantan Nation, called the Neutral by the French and the Attawandaran by the surrounding nations. These people are the original caretakers, the peoples that lived on and intimately worked with these lands. We acknowledge that we have a responsibility to know and understand their heritage. The treaty that was signed for this territory is the Between the Lakes Treaty No. 3 of 1792, and further the deed referred to as the Haldeman Proclamation of 1784, which applies to the land six miles on either side of the Grand River, from the mouth to its source. We need to be aware of our role in these documents. We also recognize the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples upon this land. We acknowledge that we have an obligation to learn to live wisely together on this land. To talk about is something that I'm working on, uh, I've been thinking about for quite a while. And it's kind of looking at this idea that if we want to really understand um, Indigenous military, military participation, we have to actually understand it as um, a family affair, really. For Indigenous people, you can do this in a couple ways. Um, there's, especially for the Haudenosaunee Six Nations military, there is the family connection to Britain through treaties. I'm going to walk you through that so we can have an understanding of what that means. Before we move on to the next two things, which is there's two other ways to think about this. There are certain families that follow traditional Haudenosaunee practices that see military participation um, on behalf of Britain or on behalf of their traditional understandings as part of their identity. And then there's also another group, though, that we have to understand with, and I call it post-contact constructions. And these are the impositions that, of course, several peoples have put on uh, Indigenous people that make them think what they're doing is traditional. Things like Wild West shows. Uh, we've all seen a John Wayne movie once in a while. If you watch those enough, you might think that, oh, the military is where I belong because that's where I see my identity, through that popular culture. So that's the three threads of this, this new uh, work that I'm uh, working on. But in order to understand the first concept, is this family connection to Britain through the treaties, we actually have to understand how treaties were made between Indigenous people and the British Crown. Now for most people in this room, I don't think I need to do a lot of introduction to these two belts. We have, of course, the two-row wampum belt, and then we have the dish with one spoon belt. Now these are traditional uh, Indigenous ways of treaty making. These symbols existed between indigenous nations, and the agreements existed between indigenous nations before Europeans showed up. They were extended to Europeans when they came here. By extending these, we actually see uh, indigenous people extending their kinship. Part of the ways you would make a treaty is, of course, you would bring the newcomer, whether it was an a person from an indigenous nation or from a European nation into your kinship group, uh, physically or as we see later in life, uh, or later in the histor historical record, uh, what we call manufactured kinship. These are through adoption ceremonies or um, other uh, conveyances, and we'll get into those too, but for the original treaty relationship, you would literally have to marry in. That was part of bringing you into the kinship. So for indigenous people, they would have been doing this within themselves because the idea was is you would never act against your family. That's how you knew that treaty was going to work. And people have always said, well, did Europeans follow this custom? Look at the fur trade. Fur trade is, and the fur trade, we see it all the time. Those economic treaties were the fur, trade, fur traders marrying in. And for the Haudenosaunee, we see this with Sir William Johnson marrying Joseph Brandt's sister, right? He's literally marrying in so he can have that treaty relationship, that kinship relationship. And with these symbols, we can understand that, yes, the uh, indigenous canoe and the uh, British ship were to stay on those parallel lines and not interfere with each other, but they were definitely linked. 
with the silver covenant chain ideas. <clears throat> right? Being the good mind, eternal friendship, peace. That's the kinship that was extended. The ideas are uh, similarly added onto with the dish with one spoon belt. This dish represented all of southwestern Ontario and the New York state lands. And the idea was, is this was a sharing treaty. This was extended first to indigenous nations. We're going to share these as communal hunting grounds. Taking only what we needed from it. Not using metal implements. Only using those wooden implements to, to stop bloodshed. It's a peace treaty. You're being brought into this. And this too was also extended to Europeans through the Nanfan Treaty and other uh, historical treaty documents. So literally, the kinship we're talking about here is family. So when we talk about indigenous military participation on behalf of a treaty relationship, that's what we're talking about. Protecting that family and that treaty unit. These things are, of course, uh, in, engraved in, symbol, in symbols. A lot of this family relationship is built off of not only those original treaty documents, but again, bringing in those family members, really starting, of course, with Queen Anne. When the Haudenosaunee delegates go over to meet Queen Anne, they come up with the idea of, of course, the Royal Chapels, first in Fort Hunter, New York, then relocated here uh, when the Mohawk came up this way. And cementing that kinship alliance again was the Silver Tea Service. That gift giving, that reciprocity. It shows that the British and other Europeans were participating in this gift giving. They understood well, at least part of what they were entering into. And that's really the big question we have about that colonial relationship. Did we actually understand what we were getting into when Europeans started accepting this kinship understanding? And we can say clearly, yes, some did. I always love this image. It's a distinctly Brantford image. Um, but what we really need to understand is that is the Duke of Cogna. He is Queen Victoria's son, Governor General. Queen Victoria was ceremonially, ceremonially adopted as a kinship member of the Haudenosaunee. We have the archival documents to show it. She was, it was done in absentia. But when her uh, children or her vice regal representatives come to this territory, they're literally brought through the ceremonies of adoption to become, in the case of the Duke of Cognat, a brother chief. That happens on his first visit in 1869. When he comes back for his second visit, he literally sits in council with the Haudenosaunee as a brother chief to discuss issues of the day, up to and including what is our treaty relationship? Can you explain it to us? What's the reciprocal benefit that you're getting? What are we getting? And he does it a third time. And he's even called upon by the Haudenosaunee to do certain tasks as a brother chief. When Pauline Johnson was sick and dying in BC, the Haudenosaunee Council write him as a, quote, brother chief. To, can you look in on our sister while you're in BC as part of your official delegation? And he did. So we can see by his actions, he at least understood part of what was happening here and what part of his responsibilities were. However, we can see with other royal visitors, it wasn't necessarily the way that they viewed it. This is, of course, the Prince of Wales in Victoria Park in Brantford, um, rekindling, at least in the eyes of the Haudenosaunee, their treaty uh, and family relationship. You can see on the table the Union Jack, the two are wampum and other wampum beads, symbols of that alliance. But we do know through the Brantford Expositor newspaper accounts he definitely laughed his way through the ceremony. He didn't quite understand what was happening. And I actually recently came across um, a copy of the official uh, biography of that tour. And yes, he very clearly in his biographer states, 
he clearly did not understand anything that was going on and thought it was just a flip ceremony. So you can see that, unless it's explained, even the royal uh, visitors or the political people in charge don't necessarily understand what this kinship looks like or what it means. But if you ever read a treaty or a treaty uh, transcript of the negotiations, Lily is probably looking at this and shuddering slightly because she's seen this slide before in one of my classes. <laughs> but you see those kinship terms. And for indigenous people, you need to understand what these kinship terms mean to understand what this treaty means to them. So first, are they a patrilineal or a matrilineal society? In the case of the Haudenosaunee, we're looking at a matrilineal society, so we're starting to see those female pronouns probably meaning more, with mother probably being higher than father, and with different duties assigned. So when you hear Queen Victoria referenced as the Great Mother, what does that mean? Well, in the Haudenosaunee culture, the parents provide for the children. By accepting that role as Great Mother, you are accepting that role as providing for the people in this treaty, that kinship group in that treaty. Brother sister, of course, would be representative of equals. The brother chief of the Duke of Cognac, right? You're an equal with us. We sit in council together. The one that always gets people is the bottom one, child. Think about what child means in our culture. Usually, you are subordinate to the parent. At least I was. <laughs> I could bring the parents in and call them, they'll tell you. Um, that's the role. But for indigenous cultures, that's not the role of a child. A child is an independent, autonomous unit that you are providing for. <coughs> you're not subordinating yourself by claiming you're a child in that treaty relationship. It changes as we start to learn these ideas. And so we have to get our heads into that space to understand what I mean by when I say that there's a kinship relationship to the treaties, but also this military participation that reinforces these. For instance, this is a chart I made once way back in my MA career just to keep my mind straight. <laughs> I was trying to look at what was going on, who were the Crown representatives, what were the reassurance, and what were the results of almost every military conflict leading up to the First World War. And you can see there that there's certain people that are vice-regal representatives that probably went through certain ceremonies or had certain understandings of what their relationship meant. Sir William Johnson, as I said, definitely married in. Uh, Sir Isaac Brock definitely was acting on behalf of the Crown and understood what that reacting needed to look like. Sir Alan Napier McNabb. Sir Garnet Wosley knew that he had to go with a Crown representative to recruit for the Nile expedition because they're not going to take it seriously unless their family member is there making those reassurances. Right? Once we start to understand this, we can start to see that the Six Nations participation is supporting those family kinship models. It can be very easily seen if you're more of a visual learner in the 114th uh, Rocks Rangers uh, Battalion colors from the First World War. Immediately you can see that there are crown symbols, the lion and the dragon, there's the oak leaves and the uh, evergreen leaves, and it's all in a circle with the clan animals, who are also part of that kinship. Literally, this is what the Haudenosaunee men from the 114th understood as their role going overseas, as equals and in kinship with the British. And you can see that here in Brantford and Brant County, we took some of this, these ideas and this imagery and we used it in our own understanding. Although there were not very many indigenous men in the 125th Battalion, at the center of the Haudenosaunee 114th colors 
is the great seal of the Confederacy of the Haudenosaunee. And it's pretty much superimposed in the center of the 125th hat patch. Did we understand that when we took that symbol? I don't know. I don't know how I'm about to try to prove that. But I do think that uh, Rick Hill, who's the original scholar to point this out, is probably onto something. That there's something ingrained here that we need to take a minute and, have, and think about. Because similar symbols appear in the 114th hat badge or the sweetheart pen. For instance, the 114th is named the Brock's Rangers, named after Sir Isaac Brock and the War of 1812 and the Haudenosaunee military relationship and that alliance. The two cross tomahawks not only pointing to again that era, but again equals. One isn't the same size, or one isn't bigger than the other, and they're together. The circle's still there, though that was in many hat badges. It probably meant a lot more to people who were thinking of the conflict or their military relationship in this circular way you see here. But the other thread that we, I wanted to talk about is of course those traditional families that seem to have an understanding of this military participation in support of this alliance and their traditional understandings of their culture. I love this picture so, so much because it is not a picture that is at all connected to the military and it is such a military image. All but two of the men in this image fought in a conflict for the British crown. All of them are chiefs. All of them in this account of this picture, but also in the account of Horatio Hale, the anthropologist who was actually recording the stories about these wampum belts, says that all of them knew what those wampum belts meant and how they and the council fit into this. We have two veterans of the War of 1812. We have um, John Smoke Johnson. I think it's Jacob Winnie, but I always get two of them confused. Because um, there's two that were famously photographed, and this is one of them I can't quite remember. But we also have uh, J.S. Johnson, John Smoke Johnson's son. Uh, served in the rebellions in the 1830s. Served in the Finian raids. And I have records of him actually forming an independent, uh, at least, uh, home protection unit at Six Nations that paraded one on the May 24th, uh, uh, the Queen's birthday. We also have in the center a very interesting character. This is uh, uh, George Buck. Actually, let me just go on my notes. I also haven't even flipped through my notes once. And that is sometimes problematic <laughs> when you're trying to get names right. Um, but what he's inter what I think is interesting for me is for is when the Canadian militia system is getting started. He is one of the commanders of the Tuscarora Rifle Company, which was an all six nations militia company. And while he's doing this, he's serving with some others. The commander of the unit was Sir William Johnson Kerr, who is a direct descendant of Joseph Brandt. So you can see again that family military lineage. He was even given uh, Joseph Brandt's title, which was rescinded from him mostly because it was a pine tree title, most likely, and not a traditional condoled chief title. But William Johnson Kerr and his family pop up in Six Nations military history over and over and over again. So he's in the Tuscarora, it's him or his son that are in the Tuscarora Rifle Company as the commander. With Buck and with another by the last name of Clinch. Both Buck and Clinch will become traditionally condoled chiefs of the Six Nations. 
So you can see that there's this family lineage going through these threads. And when the Haldeman rifles are set up in 1868, we've seen Six Nations men not really partaking until probably about 1875. But when they do, and here's their company, I like it because they have matching helmets. Um, <laughs> that's how you know it works. Uh, one of the first recruits to appear on the roll, Platch. The Haudenosaunee supported the Clench so much in his military career that they even um, uh, gave him a grant to go to the Toronto Military Institute to get his commissioned officer's papers so that the Haldeman Rifles could form their Six Nations company under Haudenosaunee leadership. So the Oshuican Company of the Haldeman Rifles, there he is in his new officer's uniform. So we see that in this pre-war context, that once we know the flow of information, we can start to see that this is the Haudenosaunee trying to make sure that their traditional knowledge and their understanding of those family alliances and kinship are ingrained in their military participation. But again, we cannot discount popular culture. We've all probably done a silly thing or two because of popular culture and what we saw on TV. In this period, it was no different. These are actual outfits of Wild West show people from uh, this area. One's at the Woodland Cultural Center on display. The other is a member of Private Jake Cook of the 114th Battalion. He was a Wild West show performer. There's a bunch of people in the 114th that were Wild West show performers, and they packed their outfits up over when they went overseas and perform Wild West show type activities as troop entertainment. But if you saw this, you might start to think, oh, maybe that's why I need to be participating in the military. Not because of those traditional ideas, but because that's what popular outside culture tells me my role is. And it's very hard to differentiate between who falls into this category and who doesn't. For instance, anybody who has a relationship to this man, Joseph Brandt, falls into this category. Is it somebody who is following a family line and a family understanding and that traditional treaty understanding? Or is it somebody who falls in line in what I had bravely called in my thesis at one point, the cult of Joseph Brandt, because I thought it kind of fits. Everything we know about Joseph Brandt in this community falls into that. William Stone's famous two-volume biography. That falls, really starts it because also there's two local biographies of Joseph Brandt, all of which skip past a lot of the colonial violence of the time and kind of glorifies, of course, that civilizing power of Joseph Brandt. That understanding of not being traditional, but being very much someone who wants to be more British than Haudenosaunee. So do we believe those biographies? Or do we believe the descendants who uh, follow in Brandt's footsteps and claim that they're acting on behalf of their family's understanding? It's a tough call to make. For instance, there are so many events that glorify Joseph Brandt in this community. One of the earliest was the relocation of Joseph Brandt's bones from uh, Burlington Bay to here. We have it in our folklore, and Douglas F. F. Rebelli who points this out, that apparently his bones were run by indigenous people from Burlington to here. But we have no proof. Ravel points this out in 1920, says there's no proof that actually happened. And if you read the official transcripts of the reinterment of his bones, there's only about four indigenous people mentioned by name, with a few saying that there's indigenous onlookers, especially from the Mohawk Institute. The rest in the parade and the procession, and even the ones that lowered the bones into the tomb, were non-indigenous people. The only time 
the Haudenosaunee seem to do anything with this grave, and this is where I really get a little bit of a dark humor moment in my life, was the erection of this fence surrounding the grave because people kept chipping off parts of it as souvenirs. <laughs> That's the only record I've found with an actual supporting moment in that. Dr. Peter Ferrugia has done tons of work on the Brandt Memorial in uh, Victoria Park. There is really only one aspect of its creation that tells you that it had some Haudenosaunee support, and that is they did put a grant forward to help construct it. They also allowed Percy Wood, the sculptor, to hang out with them enough so you could get the likenesses for the busts of the chiefs on the monument. Aside from that, again, if you start dissecting the procession, who's at the park, who's giving speeches, it's very hard to know, under, see, really, if it's a Haudenosaunee celebration or if it's a non-Indigenous celebration. We do know at the first ceremony at the laying of the cornerstone, John Smoke Johnson was there to relay the history of the Haudenosaunee peoples to the non-Indigenous audience. We also know in the second procession, uh, for the actual unveiling of the monument. Uh, the Haudenosaunee were there as part of the parade. They were actually front and center. Um, but we also know that when uh, Chief A.G. Smith came to give his uh, speech, he mentioned a few facts, one of which that um, a parliamentary government, as noted by the uh, Americans and the British system, kind of follows the Haudenosaunee model. And the transcripts are very clear. This was met with laughter from the non-Indigenous audience. So if you are one of Brand's descendants, though, and you're seeing all of this, where would you say your place is? Following that traditional family model or potentially following a construct, a colonial construct based on this image of Brand? When I was working with the GWCA, we did a lot of work on Cameron D. Brandt. And I must say, the more I dug into it, the more I could see him following the Brandt, Joseph Brandt archetype. But I don't know why. <laughs> Which is always the annoyance of any historian, and I'm pretty sure everyone in this room has done this before. You want to know why humans do what they do. And unfortunately, in the documents, it doesn't say, I did it because of this. It never says it that clearly. You have to draw that conclusion. But Cameron D. Brandt, on both sides of his family, was related to Joseph Brandt. He is the first casualty of this area and second indigenous casualty in the First World War. But if you look at his education, it's at non-indigenous high schools. As soon as he graduates, he goes to Lowesley Barracks in London to become an officer to follow in the footsteps of Joseph Brandt. So by the time the First World War rolls around, he's no longer even living uh, at uh, New Credit or the Haudenosaunee Territory. He's living in Hamilton, working in the steel industry. But when he is uh, eventually, when he eventually enlists in the 4th Battalion with a bunch of his relatives, a lot of his cousins joined him following that Brandt motif, that this is where we feel we need to be. He gets promoted because he has officer training, and as I said, he is our second casualty. And when he does, when he is a casualty, of course, the city council here in Brantford write a condolence to the Haudenosaunee saying, we are sorry that our fellow brother has perished in battle. That's that traditional family linkage, right? That we talked about before. However, if you read the Brantford Expositor, all of the articles talk about Joseph Brandt and his loyalism to the crown when describing Cameron D. Brandt's death. So where does he fall on our spectrum? As I said, as a historian, I'm angry, I can't tell you. I just can't, I want to so bad, but there's no document from Cameron D. Brandt that says, this is why I did it. <laughs> that would be so easy. <laughs> yeah, can I ask a question at this point? And that is, at this period in history, if those men were enlisting, were, were they still 
did they have to give up their status, or could they maintain native status and? So, if you are enlisting in the militia, the Holden Rifles, pre-World War, you can keep your status. That was not an issue. The issue mostly comes from, from my understanding and from how I've been able to read into it, it's mostly coming home. That's the issue. When you came home, you could not claim veterans' benefits as an indigenous person. You had your own benefits as an indigenous person, according to the Crown, and that was through the Department of Indian Affairs. Those, those benefits were at such a low level compared to a veteran's benefit. The only way you could get veterans' benefits was to renounce your indigenous citizenship. And if he was living in Hamilton, yes. at that point, home property, you could not be indigenous. I don't, he did own a farm. This person, yeah. yeah, he did own a farm. And so, as I said, I don't know where he falls on this spectrum. I have a lot of questions. But as I said, it was sort of the preliminary research we were doing. But as I said, a lot of this research I'm presenting right now is just sort of like early findings. Yeah, I'm um, that person's act couldn't come into it. Right, right. And I don't really have that answer. As I said, I need his, I did it because of this document. Yeah. And unfortunately, most historical people never write those. <laughs> Thank you. No worries, that would be a good question. As I said, we also start to see that outside appropriation. We kind of talked about that with this image here. But we can also talk about it with other things that I was granted access to due to the Great War Centenary Association. For instance, as I said, the 125th starts appropriating some of this family imagery. And when they produce their regimental newspaper, the War Whoop, kind of a problematic title right out of the gate, you can see that the motifs they're using, they have their hat badge, but they also have the bust of Joseph Grant. The first issue, cover our chief, which is their commander. And they're even naming their mascot, Brant, which was apparently a small carriage pony. The most interesting part about this whole dialogue is in their own newspaper, they say they chose the, uh, uh, the idea of Brant as the mascot and this indigenous understanding because of Brantford's long connection to the indigenous military of this area. Even though there's very few indigenous recruits. So they're taking on these motifs and this idea that they are honoring this family kinship. But as I said, if you actually read these papers, I don't really see it. There's a lot of very negative and problematic imagery associated with not only the title of the paper, but a lot of the stories, especially when they do go for training in Ashwika. But that doesn't mean that those traditional people I talked about before weren't part of the First World War. I have many stories of, of course, these, um, these First World War uh, uh, soldiers coming through and their stories being told. The problem is, is we're looking at about a sample size of about 325 people when we're looking at the Haudenosaunee got Grand River's uh, participation in the First World War. So we can't really do a cross-section of all 325. I think that was what I really, really, really wanted to do with the Great War Centenary Association, but then I realized we didn't have the files. It just wasn't there, but there are certain stories. For instance, there's one story that the Department of Indian Affairs tried to co-opt very early in the war to say that the Haudenosaunee were actually acculturated people who were just the same as the settler culture. Like the goal of the Department of Indian Affairs was complete. And that was a veteran by the name of Alfred Styers. In Duncan Campbell Scott's account, the head of the Department of Indian Affairs, he said as soon as war was announced, Styers was in his field, he dropped everything, told his neighbor to look after my farm, I'm going to go enlist. And he said that that proves Styers was an acculturated person. I started digging into Styers because I said, oh, that seems weird. That seems one line too weird. I started looking into it. What Scott left out was Styers, pre-war, was most likely adopted by Nicodemus Porter, a condoled Six Nations Confederacy chief at a very young age. And when Styers enlisted in 1914, so did Porter's son Charles. 
Charles left his wife and family to actually go overseas to support his understanding of the traditional relationship. Star, uh, Charles would be discharged in 1917 after a fairly inactive career, mostly due to pre-existing health conditions. Stiers, however, rose to the rank of sergeant, suffered from a dangerous shrapnel wound to his hip in 1916, and was declared unfit for service by 1917. Another publicized story that showed that indigenous people were assimilated, but really weren't, was one that I found in the Simcoe Reformer, entitled Sammy the Indian Soldier. Sammy comes into the recruiting station. They say, nope, you're not fit. We can't take you on. You have bad eyesight. So he goes to another recruiting station. They say, nope, we can't take you on. You have bad eyesight. He goes to the rifle range. It turns out he is a crack shot. The problem, he does not know the English alphabet for the eye test. <laughs> Sammy does enlist. Uh, he is finally allowed to enlist. Uh, he's wounded in 1916, and when his father, Edward, gets word of this to protect his family, he immediately enlists to go help out his son. Although Sammy would actually be brought home, probably as his father was being shipped out, <laughs> just because his wounds were quite severe, uh, both would survive the war with Sam being killed actually in a car accident in 1943. <laughs> Um, at his funeral, however, the veterans and the outside community came to actually honor that veteran. Again, showing there's, there's this family connection in this. Some are very interesting cases of family connections in military service. I bring you Cornelius Cusick. He is the last probably Six Nations military commander to lead troops in active battle in the U.S. Civil War. He raised an entire company of Haudenosaunee troops from the New York area. Um, his family lineage goes all the way back pre-American Revolution. When the First World War is announced, uh, Cornelius is no longer in the picture. But of course, his uh, descendant, Private Simon Cusack, jumps the US border and enlists in the 114th Battalion Haldeman uh, Rifles the Brox Rangers. And his justification is, this is my family's military lineage to both the United States and Britain, which have a common heritage. He says, the border doesn't exist in my world. This is all Haudenosaunee land. I can enlist wherever I want. And would that also explain why a huge number of Six Nations people enlisted in Vietnam as well? Yes, there is um, a, the border going the other way, yes. <laughs> uh, we do see a lot of uh, the Vietnam veterans from, uh, from this area uh, doing the same thing. This is just one of the more interesting because, of course, he's got that family right. bridge that goes so far back. Um, apparently, one of his, friend, uh, one of his uh, relatives was the aide-de-camp to, uh, uh, to Lafayette in the American Revolution. <laughs> like, it's a, it's a star-spangled lineage. <laughs> Another way we can look at this, of course, is through what women were doing during the First World War. The Six Nations Patriotic League is probably one of the most interesting cases because when non-Indigenous people tried to show up to set up a Patriotic League at Six Nations, they found one had already started. They really didn't need any prompting. And that's because the traditional role in that family kinship understanding is that men can't go to battle without the women's permission because the women created everything you needed to go to battle. And in the same way, the Six Nations Patriotic League embodied this ideal. They were making socks, helmet covers, mittens, you name it. If you needed it, they could knit it. If they couldn't knit it, they were fundraising so they could purchase it for their troops. And we know that this is something that continued to happen even before the First World War. Evelyn Johnson's uh, diary is very clear about this, that when the Finian raids were starting, the women of Six Nations mobilized as their troops were heading out, making bandages and getting ready for the post-conflict post aftermath. They allowed their men to go, but we better get ready for what's about to happen. 
two very traditional uh, uh, families. And again, names we're back to remembering. George Buck comes from a very traditional family. He's from that Buck lineage we talked about before. And when he enlists, he honestly believes he is following this. And when he comes home, he and his family become informants to some of the most noted anthropologists in working in this area, telling them what their traditional culture is. They know how this military service fit into it. Same goes for Simeon Gibson. His father, John Arthur Gibson, is probably one of the most famous indigenous, quote unquote, informants in anthropology. Uh, Hewitt, uh, Parker, uh, William Fenton would use John Arthur Gibson. The problem is, John Arthur Gibson is blind in one eye due to a lacrosse accident. So he uses his son, John Hardy and Simeon, to actually tell him or to relay what he's saying in his traditional language to the anthropologists. And John Hardy and Simeon both enlist in the First World War. They both are highly decorated. They both come back and continue to work with anthropologists. Simeon's even tapped on the shoulder to potentially become a condoled chief. And if it wasn't for him going missing on the Grand River in, 19, in the 1940s, he probably would have done that. His canoe was found empty. They never found the body. A.G. Smith, the one who's giving the speeches at the Grant Memorial, his two sons, A.G.E. and uh, Charles Denton Smith, both enlist, following their father's advice, who's a traditional condoled chief. Both earn high medals for bravery, the military cross. One even gets a declaration from the Polish Army for his role training the Polish Army recruits from the United States at Camp Niagara. He's the only one in all of Canada to receive a Polish combination. They're both following this. Actually, he gets his military cross, Charles Denton, from the Prince of Wales while he's visiting in 1919. That's him actually just after receiving it. And going into World War II and Vietnam and those modern conflicts, most indigenous veterans of those conflicts say it was the stories from before and after the First World War that made them enlist. Even Frederick Loft, in 1898, told the Canadian Military Institute that every conflict that the Six Nations participated in, just like their treaty relationship, added on to the next. It became part of their understanding and their folklore. So, some relatives said of Tom Longboat, if it wasn't for him telling us stories of the war, we wouldn't have been listening. Um, oh, uh, oh, yeah, but it's O-L-M. I was get, I'm going by initials and I always confuse them. I think I might have a problem. Um, <laughs> O.M. Martin, the highest ranking indigenous veteran, becomes actually a, uh, a judge. His relatives say his stories were the reason why they enlisted in the, pre, in the conflicts going after the First World War. It's that lineage that makes things like this possible. This is another Haudenosaunee veteran that I've done extensive work on, uh, Wilfred Lickers. This is his great, great, great grandson, Kenneth Liggins, at a repatriation ceremony of his medals to back to his family. I have talked to the family members. They don't know why they feel the need to be in the military, but it's always something they felt needed to happen. This is the reason why we see a lot of indigenous people still in the military, is they're following these understandings, either through their individual families or these larger family constructed kinship networks. And as I said, I'm very much in the infancy of this work, so I hope you really enjoyed this talk. But I just wanted to leave you with some of these ideas. That once we under, start understanding how the family kinship networks work, through treaties or just through personal experience, we can actually make sense of the Haudenosaunee military participation from the beginning of their treaties to the First World War, which is where I usually end, <laughs> and beyond. 
So thank you.